about getting started um, with the making of Evil Everywhere and how did that kick off? Um, well, I don't know if you saw the short film that I did before that that was called Power Tuto. <laughs> it's, uh, Evil Everywhere is technically a sequel. So, uh, in the first, in the opening of Evil Everywhere, it recaps the short film that was Power Tuto, which means Fear All. So basically the two films have a similar title. The first one was an Italian title, which roughly translates to Fear Everything or Fear All. And so when I went to make the sequel, it was called Evil Everywhere. It's very meta because I wanted Evil Everywhere to like play like their actual relics from the past rather than like, I never wanted it to be like we're turning to the camera and winking about it being the 80s. Once I had made Power Tuto, which was a fake trailer, was not a full film, I thought I really liked that whole style and I had a lot of fun with that so I thought when I did the sequel why not make a full feature length film. Uh, I know you got some comments and criticisms on that film of maybe people who did or did not understand that that was intentional or that's what yeah. you were trying to do so tell me about what kind of criticisms did you get? Yeah I uh, like I think there was one person that reviewed the film and they erroneously thought that I was going for a shot on video look and they're like why is there a film grade if it's a shot on video look I'm like well, dummy, maybe it's not a shot on video. It's supposed to look like an HD transfer of a really rough film print that was probably shot on Super 8 or Super 16. Um, I know what I'm doing. Uh, I kind of, like I feel kind of like snobby when I when I say things like that, but I feel like the other comments were like talking about how like, you know, oh, it's really cheesy and like, you know, the dialogue is wooden. It's like, that's the point. Oh, so I went to the dark arts. Yeah, it's kind of hobby I picked up. Spell casting, curses, oh, healing. She's an asset, all right? So you're either with us or you're not. It's supposed to be a bad film. Like, if you've ever seen Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, I suggest you check it out. It's on Netflix now. Check it out. That is a show that I watched in high school on Adult Swim, and it blew my mind. That, along with uh, Grindhouse, which everybody knows, Planet Terror, uh, Death Proof. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and I, the, my thing is like, I don't ever like to play it so obvious. I'm not into comedy where it's like, whoa, it's the 80s. Hey, welcome, welcome to the 80s. <laughs> like, I wanted it to feel like it could be from the past. Yeah. So my whole intention was that with, with like, to the best of my ability, I'm gonna shoot it with, you know, period appropriate clothing. I don't have a really big budget to, you know, build sets or modify locations or anything like that. So I had to make sacrifices. There are a lot of shots in the film, which maybe aren't up to par with the kind of production value that I want to have. There are a couple of shots in the film where like, you know, the costumes aren't all that right. And maybe I had a costume picked out, but it didn't fit the actor. So we had to improvise and use some of their own wardrobe. Um, there I think considering it's no budget, it came out fabulously. And um, tell you. me about some of your, the making of some of your special effects, because those were very um, cool. Yeah, there's uh, the special effects again, DIY, I did it myself um, with just whatever money I had. And I would go to like Party City, I would go to on Amazon and I'd just get like the cheapest stuff and like liquid latex and toilet paper. And um, I kind of just improvise based on like the fundamentals of how things are done. Like there's a scene where this girl uh, mutilates her boyfriend basically with a knife. Uh, and cuts his stomach open and guts him and throws his guts up against the wall. So what we had to do was my friend and I, um, we just got all this stuff from like Home Depot and we built a fake set inside my mom's garage that was supposed to look like a, like a bedroom. And then I built a fake body cavity so that um, it could, the body cavity could be laying on the bed and there was a hole actually that I painstakingly cut into the mattress so that his body could go through. Wow. And then there's a fake body and she stands into it. So like, I just- What were the guts made out of? Uh, pantyhose that I like liquid latex and glued together and stuffed with cotton balls and then soaked like layers and layers and layers of liquid latex. Uh, it's all like just taking like random like stuff that you have around Mm -hmm. um, and understanding the principle of like one thing and then like expanding on that to like make it work for what you need. Like the uh, sticks that jam into the girl's uh, stomach, um, they fly in and, and stick into her stomach. And I, I'd already done something like that in an older film of mine, Scary Larry, uh, where the killer jams a bunch of sticks into this guy's stomach and then you just mm -hmm. see them protruding out. And it was the same basic principle where um, there's like a little thing like a harness that she wears and there's like little screws and stuff So like one by one I could cut 
screw a stick in that had a little, you know, screw head on the end, stick it in, screw it in, you know, through the cut in the shirt, put some blood around it, film, have her go, ugh, like that, and then it looks like, you know, it's- Each it's, individual yeah, stick yeah. is So, I think there was one scene where we really had to make a sacrifice with the quality, because first of all, the actor was vegan, mm. and second of all, we could not figure out how to do a head cast so I'm talking about we, I'm saying me. I could not figure out how to do a head cast with my friend. <laughs> so we had to sacrifice that. And uh, he falls and hits his head on the rocks at the beach. And basically it's just like- Wait, where does the vegan come in on this? Because <laughs> we couldn't use like meat or anything that had like animal product. Oh. So we had to use like cranberry sauce and red food dye. There's all these kind of things that like, you have to know like what went into it to appreciate like where it sort of falls short because like yeah like i can sit there and like beat myself up because like uh you know certain shots are like wonky or certain effects are wonky or certain set pieces are wonky but i know the struggle that went into that and i know that it took me like about a year and a half just to shoot principal photography mm -hmm. and then i had to go get like inserts and pickups and you know it took another long time to just edit and uh, have the sound design done and then like, you know, get all the soundtrack picks, so. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a parody of like Dario Argento and Lucio Fulci. Yeah. And like the Italian giallo horror films, which are inherently very confusing. There's a lot of usually like separate plot threads running together. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, uh, you know, really aggressive gore and death scenes that like seemingly come out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, so my satire of that is to basically have it so that like evil itself is killing people in like mysterious, almost like final destination ways where it's like, yeah. it's not like somebody killing somebody else. It's like they kind of like end up looking like they killed themselves or it was a freak accident. And I think to a degree, like there were elements in the film when I was shooting it where I did want it to be like serious and stoic. And then I wanted the comedy to like come from the awkwardness of things. A hundred years later, the curse was set to take place. Your graduating class. I wanted the humor to kind of come more from the absurdity of the situations. And yeah. the absurdity of like, you know, I would make like intentionally bad cuts where like you would see like the film kind of skip, like as if it was like badly spliced together, like the film kind of skips or the action skips. There's like a weird jump cut. Um, so like all of that is intentional. Like I wanted it to seem like it's a badly put together film. And I wanted the dialogue to sound like it was dubbed. You gave me one simple case and now it's just turned into this fucking hell. Say no more. I'll take your word for it. Yeah. And I would just take the audio from the good take and sync it up with the other takes. So sometimes it really works, but then there's that uncanny situation where like the dialogue matches the lips a little bit. And then there's like a couple of lines of dialogue where it doesn't match. I can also kind of feel the evil. Just saying. Oh, and I think yeah. that kind of like added to the sort of like, is this a foreign film? Yeah. Um, I think it's important to know that aspect of it before you watch it or while you watch it, just to like understand it's like, you know, this is not like a team of people that were just, you know, this is not like the room where it's like a team of people and like a megalomaniac director who thinks he's like, you know, gold. <laughs> this is like, you know, this is what it is and what it appears to be. It's like, it's me for fun because I was passionate about it. I wanted to make a feature film. How did the film get distributed? Um, I actually, I didn't really know at first. I, I told everybody that was in it that I was like, I'm just gonna like, this is gonna get out there somehow. Like I'm either gonna like submit it to festivals. Yeah. Um, and my thing was like, I'm gonna try to get it distributed by a distributor. And if that fails, I'll just upload it to YouTube as a last resort. Um, and so this was around like late 2019. It's right when I had finished the edit of the film. And I did a like a private screening with Cinema Obscura in Chicago. So there was a couple of people that showed up for the first time to, cool. to see the film. Yeah, it was cool. It was cool because I got to see the audience reaction and see like how they laughed and reacted to certain things. Nice. Um, yeah. And uh, I went to a horror convention and I just kind of walked around and I'm really shy. So I kind of just walked around and I was like, I don't want to like solicit. I don't feel, I'm not one of those people that wants to walk up to people and say like, hey, I'm a filmmaker, look at my stuff. But I kind of like just like, you know, looked around and saw like different distribution tables that were around with their collection of low budget DVDs and stuff. And I went, hmm. And I just sort of like started looking up um, distributors of low budget horror, indie distributors and stuff like that. And just seeing yeah. and whoever had a free, you know, submit a film. Uh, 
I went with Wild Eye because I thought it would be really cool to have not only streaming, but a DVD distribution. Yes, and it's, it's free on Amazon Prime right now. Yeah. Um, and then it's like, it's on DVD as well. I don't actually know, like, if it's available in, like, stores on DVD. I don't know where that would be. That would be cool. Like, if, Kim's, on Amazon. if Kim's Video in New York was still around, I think it would be cool to put it in Kim's Video. It's a lot of work. And then you have to be kind of insane to Actor, do something Actor, like director, that. producer. <laughs> yeah, like, and I didn't even, I didn't even yeah. really want to be in the movie, but because I played the character in, in Power Tuto, like the short film, I was like, I've got to be the same character in this one because it's a sequel. Yeah. You have to be on top of the framing of the shot, the lighting, make sure the sound's okay. Even if you've got a buddy on hand, he might not understand your vision. You don't know if it's going to turn out well. And then you go back and review the footage and it's like, ah, oh, you know, I, I the, the, the framing was weird or like my pacing was weird. I'm going to do it again. So you got to wear two hats at once. Sometimes it can be yeah, kind of- Yeah, Yeah, and annoying. If I did it another go round, I'd probably do things differently. I mean, like I've grown as a filmmaker since then. So certainly like my skills and abilities have gotten better. Um, I watch the film and I'll see certain things and I'll think oh, I could do that better now or I would have done this differently if not of better. Of course, that's the self-criticism yeah. of every artist, I think. Yeah, so fair enough. And people have said, like, Did, have you watched reviews of your film? And I'm like, I try to avoid uh, looking at reviews of my <laughs> film. Rue Morgue gave it a, a stellar review. Well, they seem to get it. They understood this is a hokey schlocky film. They said, like, the special effects are, like, far too good than they have any right to be. And I was like, all right, I'll take that. <laughs> um, and then uh, other reviews have praised the soundtrack, which I can't take complete credit for because I did a couple of soundtrack stuff. I did the theme song and a few different cues that appear throughout, but there are a lot of music tracks from other artists. And if I did this again, I think I would try to make sure we could have a little bit better planning with like what needs to be funded and how much we need. $10,000. I think most important though to completing any of these films really is just having actors that are gung-ho, that will show up, that have free time, that are flexible and patient and understanding of the fact that this is not a professional production, but that doesn't mean that it's nonsense and it doesn't mean that you, you get to like not take it seriously. A lot of people ask me, why are you making this? What are you making this for? And I said, why does there need to be a reason to make stuff? It's passion for the art. Yeah. If I did a sequel to Evil Everywhere, and I thought about that, mm -hmm. it would be like Evil in the City, and I would I kind of, uh, well, you know, we'll tease it. Okay. It would be evil, like Evil in the City, and a little bit of a nod to vampire movies and things like uh, Return of the Living Dead, and mm -hmm. I want to say Frankenhooker. <laughs> even further like I want to go even sleazier I feel like shock value yeah a little more shock value but a little more humor take it a little you know this yeah. this was ambitious how can we take it to the next level yeah so uh, it's one of those films I think it works best if you go into it like drunk or high honestly <laughs> honestly um, and not expecting like cinematic gold because I was not shooting for cinematic gold I was shooting for troll 2 and if you like troll 2 <laughs> maybe you'll like this